Please turn with me as I go to Psalm 63, and I read as follows. O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water, Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary, to see your power and your glory, because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my soul offers praises with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth they will be delivered over to the power of the sword. They will be a prey for foxes. But the king will rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him will glory, for the mouths of those who speak lies will be stopped. We continue in our study through the book of Psalms, and we come after last week, having read from a psalm of the sons of Korah, we return to King David, the shepherd king, Psalm 63. And the inscription before verse 1, which in fact in the Hebrew Bible is the first verse, and then verse 2 is, or, or verse 1 of our Bible is verse 2 for them, and so on. The inscription says, A psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. In the wilderness we find David again. Now some who have studied and tried to pinpoint, well, was this when David was being pursued by King Saul before David himself was king? Or was this when Absalom sought to take the throne from his father and David had to flee from Jerusalem in that time of turmoil? I think that it is more likely that this time when David was in the wilderness of Judah was not when Saul was king. David consistently honored King Saul as the king and would not raise his hand against him. We have in verse 11, David referring to himself as king. And so undoubtedly this is later in David's life when David was driven from his throne, along with others, that this was during the time of Absalom's rebellion. And what, what a time of heaviness that was for David when his own son rose up against him and when he had to flee for his own life. But let's consider what David says here while he is in the wilderness once again. David wrote numerous times when he was in that hard and difficult place. Here he begins, O oh God, you are my God. And everything that flows in the following verses and statements, all of the declarations that David makes, they hinge upon that introductory, that opening statement, O oh God, you are my God, my God. 
We teach our young children that they should not be possessive, that they should not cling to those things round about them, that they should have a generous and open heart. But there is a time when it is perfectly right and proper for us to be possessive of those things round about us. I speak of my wife because she has bound herself to me and I to her she is mine. She is not anyone else's wife. She has declared herself for me and for me only. She is my wife. When we come to spiritual things, it's good for us to speak of my Bible. Of course, it is the Bible, and this is a Bible. It is one copy, and there are numerous others in my office, but it's good for us to speak of my Bible because this is my book that I have received and which I have been fed from, which I have been strengthened from, which I go to in order to have my soul uplifted, my spirit challenged, for me to find direction and wisdom, this is my Bible. It's good for each and every one of us to have our own Bible and not simply to say, well, these are the pages which I call my own. You see in the front cover that I've written my name or perhaps someone else who gave it to you at a time of birthday or celebration, a Christmas gift that well, this is, this is his Bible. When it's lost, it's returned to its owner. It's good for us to say, I have soaked in this and it has gotten into me even as I have gotten into it. It's good for us to say, this is mine. It's good for us to say, this is my church. Now, of course we say that every church and the church all around the world, all those who are trusting in Christ and who have saving faith and who are looking forward with eager anticipation to the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it is his church and he is the workman, he is the foreman of the task, and he is the one who calls us into service that we might serve in his harvest field. It is his church, he has shed his blood, and he is coming back for his bride, the church, he, the great bridegroom. But yet, it is good for us to speak of my church. I belong there. I am a part of what is taking place there. It isn't simply a church. It isn't simply the church at large, but it is a place where I connect, where I plug in, where I am involved, where I am blessed. And praise to God, I am a means of encouraging and strengthening and blessing others round about me. Not that people might set their eyes upon me, but that God is faithfully at work pouring blessing through each vessel to one another. My church. It's good for us to say my Bible and my church. It's good for us to say my faith. It's one thing to talk about the faith of your mother or your father or, or of your grandfather, your grandmother. It's good to talk about the faith of men and women who we find in the scriptures. Oh, what faith they had. We come to Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, and we walk along that hall and we see those men and women who trusted in God it's one thing for them to have faith. It's one thing for the preacher and the pastor. It's one thing for the elders and for the leadership of the church to have faith. 
but each and every one of us, it becomes a personal thing. Just as a Bible needs to be a personally entered into book, and just as a church needs to be something more than just a building down the street that you visit for a funeral or for a wedding, a faith, the hymn, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place, not in device nor creed. My faith, not the faith of someone else, but the faith that resides in my heart. It is living, it is active, it is saving faith. And it's good for each and every one of us, like David here, to say, My God, my God. He is someone who is not just the man upstairs. He is not the governor of all the earth, although he is the judge of all the earth. He is my God. He is the one who knows my name and I know who he is because we have communed together, because we have shared wonderful fellowship. Even as Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, we have walked together and we have delighted in each other's presence. And it comes about because of Christ shedding his blood on Calvary that the old wall of separation might be broken down and that we might look and that we might say, you are my God, my God. Do you have a Bible that you say, this is my Bible, and you're possessive of it? whether it's marked up all through and in every page or it's just something that you have and that you have delighted in. Do you have a Bible and is it truly yours? Do you have a church? Is it really yours or is it really your family's as a general thing? Do you have a faith? Do you have, like David, oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly, earnestly. I've been considering, as I've read through the passages of the scripture reading schedule we have fo been following this year, coming to the books of Moses, how that when the law was given from God through Moses to the people, that there was a repeated emphasis to them, you shall be careful to observe. Lest we think that that has simply to do with nitpicky, dietary laws and rules about when they did such and such and sacrifices, it was an impression that was to be made upon the hearts of the people that they were not to worship God in any willy-nilly, careless, casual manner. They were to be attentive to what God had to say. Many of the things which God gave them it was a means of testing them whether they would attend to God's word or whether they would say, well, we've got other ideas about how we can go about this. They certainly did have other ideas, as we found at the time when the people made a golden calf and they bowed down to it and they worshipped and they danced around that golden calf that Aaron, Moses' brother, had formed in the New Testament, we find Jesus himself saying, Blessed are ye if you do what I say. Hearing is one thing, and hearing is the beginning. Hearing is good. It needs to sink into our hearts, and it needs to permeate every fiber of our being. But it needs to come out in the things that we do, the things that we value, the things that we honor. Jesus says, blessed are ye if you 
do those things which I have commanded you. We desire that we not live as close as we can. Many times I find that people are trying to figure out how close to the world can I live without getting burned. But as Hebrews in the New Testament tells us and bids us, pushes us, it's not how close we can live to the world. Hebrews says to us repeatedly, draw near, let us draw near to the throne of God in full confidence because of what Christ, the better sacrifice, the better priest, working on the principles of a better covenant has made possible for us. Let us draw near. It's a sad thing when believers want to draw near to the world when Christ bids us to draw near to him instead. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. When David says, I shall seek you earnestly, there was a hungering, there was a longing. He says, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh yearns for you. Here is David taking his great descendant, Jesus, his greatest descendant, taking his word even before those were spoken. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. David, he was one who was thirsting and yearning for the very goodness and presence, for the nearness of God. And verse 2, he says, Thus I have seen you. I have seen you in the sanctuary your power, your glory, your power, your glory, a right focus and goal. This world had lost its allure to David, the power of this world and the glory of this world, all deficient and cheap imitations of the real power and glory of God. Verse 3 your loving kindness better. Your loving kindness, the love which David had received from the heart of God, the kindness, the promises, the mercy that David had received, he declares, Lord, your loving kindness, it's better, it's sweeter, it's more satisfying than life itself. And he says that I will praise you. And that is ever the right response in the presence of God. Let me remind you where David is. David, he is a pursued man. And not only him, but those round about him. Perhaps David could say, well, if I die, then... That's all that happens. But there were others all round about him who he was responsible for and whose lives were in his very hands. If he was killed, they would surely meet death as well. David is hard-pressed, and yet he finds strength in God. He is comforted in God. He lifts his voice in praise to God for all of his goodness, for his mercy, for his kindness. And he says, I'm going to seek you, Lord. I'm going to go after you. I am going to consider the riches that you have to offer as better than food and life itself. In the verses which follow, beginning with verse 4, there are a number of declarations and let me remind you that all that takes place through the whole psalm, it hinges and it is there because of that introductory statement, O oh God, you are my God. 
Beginning with verse 4, David, in succession, he says, I will bless you. He says, I will lift up my hands. He talks about satisfaction, and he speaks of praises with joy. It's one thing to praise with a heavy heart out of a sense of duty, but when you have joy in the heart because God has placed there, and you're lifting your hands in joyful praise to the God of all creation. David, he says that I will remember you on my bed. I'm titling this Midnight Meditation. Well, David, he says, on my bed in the middle of the night, in the midnight watches, I will meditate. I remember, I meditate. He says, I am helped. And he says, I sing. He says, I am upheld. There is a mighty hand that holds David in the very palm of his hand. He says, I am protected. And he says, I will rejoice. I will glory. And he says, I will see lies stopped. Those who speak lies, their mouths will be stopped. All the way back to the top, you are my God. I'm thinking in Acts chapter 16 of when Paul and Silas came to Philippi on their missionary journey number two. And we read that after there was the conversion of the woman from Thyatira by the name of Lydia, and after there was the freeing of that demon-possessed girl who served as a fortune teller, that Paul and Silas were grabbed, thrown in jail after having been beaten with rods. This is what I read. The crowd rose up together against Paul and Silas against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now verse 25 especially. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. I wonder, I wonder if Psalm 63 was a part of their repertoire that night. I wonder if they identified with David and the hardship which he was experiencing a thousand years before, I wonder if Paul and Silas looked at each other and said, you know what would be perfect for this night? We've been beaten. We've been mistreated. We've been lied about. We have not deserved what we received. I wonder if they went and said, oh God, you are my God. I shall continue to seek you earnestly. I will continue to thirst and yearn for you. I have seen you in the sanctuary and your power, your glory. It's better than anything that the pagans talk about and that the pagans worship. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. What happened next? And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When we exalt the Lord, when we praise his name, 
mighty things happen, not necessarily in a physical sense as we would wish them to, but always in the spirit, always, always, always in the spirit, there are mighty things which take place and God is glorified and his people most certainly can rejoice. Do you have a Bible? Get it out. Do you have a church? Be an active, vibrant part of it. Don't just have your family name or your own name somewhere listed in the record books in some dusty old file. Be a part. Be a living, vibrant part of it. Do you have a faith? Do you? Really? Jesus spoke of two different builders, the one who built upon the sand and the one who built upon a firm foundation. Is your faith, is your trust, is your confidence built upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ? Make sure it is. Make very sure it is. Do you have a God? Oh, I would say that everyone has a God, something that they worship. We have been made to worship. But most people in this world, they worship all the wrong things. Most of us are polytheists. We worship many gods. You need to have one and only one. One who directs you. The one who blesses you. One who is able to receive you for all eternity home to glory. I would bid you to come to Psalm 63 and with David in a difficult part of his life, how that he speaks, O oh God, you are my God. Let that be more than just a few words on a page in the middle of a Bible. Let that be a statement which you can honestly and rightly pray and give thanks to God. Lord, we do give you thanks and praise for all of your goodness. And we rejoice how that David speaks of his God, that you were my God, David speaking, and that the same can be true of us. We don't need to be the king over a whole nation. We don't need to be a president or prime minister or a premier or a mayor. Lord, you are concerned about those who are just ordinary in every sense of the word. For that is where we find ourselves. Oh God, you are my God. And may everyone who hears me now May they in like manner speak to you in these very terms. My God, my Bible, my church, my faith. So Lord, work in power, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.